Chapter 29 The Black Spot Again The Black Spot The Council of the Buccaneers had lasted some time when one of them re-entered the house and with a repetition of the same salute which had in my eyes an ironical air Begged for a moment's loan of the torch. In a money at orange, please. Silver briefly agreed. There you go. And this emissary retired again. Cheers. <laughs> Leaving us alone together in the dark. There's a breeze coming, Jim, said Silver, who had by this time adopted quite a friendly and familiar tone. I turned to the loophole nearest to me and looked out. The embers of the great fire had so far burned themselves out and now glowed so low and duskily that I understood why these conspirators desired a torch. About halfway down the slope to the stockade, they were collected in a group. One held the light, another was on his knees in their midst, and I saw the blade of an open knife shine in his hands with varying colours. In the moon and torchlight. The rest were all somewhat stooping. As though watching the manoeuvres of this last. I could just make out that he had a book as well as a knife in his hand. And was still wondering how anything so incongruous had come into their possession. When the kneeling figure rose once more to his feet. And the whole party began to move together towards the house. Here they come, said I. And I returned to my former position. For it seemed beneath my dignity that they should find me watching them. Well, let them come, lad, let them come, said Silver cheerily. I've still a shot in me locker. The door opened, and the five men, standing huddled together just inside, pushed one of their number forward. In any other circumstances, it would have been comical to see his slow advance, hesitating as he set down each foot. But holding his closed right hand in front of him. Step up, lad! cried Silver. I won't eat you, hand it over, lubber. I know the rules, I do. I won't hurt the deputation. Thus encouraged, the buccaneer stepped forth more briskly, and having passed something to Silver from hand to hand, slipped yet more smartly back again to his companions. The sea cook looked at what had been given him. The black spot. I thought so, he observed. Now, for anyone who's joined us since we began this tale, of course, the black spot is a sign passed from one pirate to another to signify that that pirate, what's been, what's received the black spot, has had the death sentence passed upon his head. If we recall all the way back to chapter one or two, um, uh, let's see here. Um, we might remember Captain Billy Bones and the Admiral Bembo. What's this they have given me? The black spot? Oh, God, Jesus. Oh, no. They're gonna come and kill me, Jim. They're gonna come and kill me. And then he stood up. Uh, and his head blew up because he drunk too much rum. So the pirates never had to kill him in the end, but they had given him the black spot to signify that he was done for. The black spot, he observed. I thought so. Where might you have got the paper? Why? Hello, look here now. This ain't lucky. You've gone and cut this out of a Bible. What f fools cut a Bible? Ah, there, said Morgan. There, what did I say? No good will come of that, I said. Well, you've about fixed it now among you, continued Silver. You'll all swing now, I reckon. What's soft-headed lubber at the Bible? It was Dick, said one. 
Dick, was it? Then, then Dick can get the prayers, said Silver. He's seen his slice of luck as Dick. And you may lay to that. But here the long man with the yellow eyes struck in. But lay that talk, John Silver, he said. This crew has tipped you the black spot in full council, as in duty bound. Just you turn it over, as in duty bound, and see what's wrote there. And you can talk. He's quite, um... He's got this, this fella's quite, uh... The, the, the yellow-eyed, uh... Sort of cirrhosis-looking fella. He seems he's... He's not, um, he's not frightened of Long John. Thank he, George, replied the seacock. <gasps> Is it me? <laughs> Am I the man with yellow eyes who's not frightened of Long John? <gasps> Thank he, George, replied the seacock. I always enjoyed Daphne when they were on. <gasps> it is me! No, I'm joking. That's not, that's not written there. <clears throat> Thank you, George, replied the sea cook. You always was brisk for business and as the rules by art, George, as I'm pleased to see. Well, what is it anyway? Ah, deposed. That's it, is it? Very pretty road, to be sure. Like print, I swear. You're under right, George. Why, well, you was getting quite a leading man in this here crew. You'll be captain next. I shouldn't wonder. Just oblige me with that torch again, will you? This pipe won't draw. Come now, said George. I'm sure Long John will be a fan of your sketch. Thanks. Thanks for his words. I like to think so. I like to think that even a, a seafaring murderer in the 18th century would have enjoyed Posty Pat. Posty. My bread and butter, that sketch. My bread and butter. Uh, come now, said George. You don't fool this crew no more. You're a funny man by your account, but you're over now. Thanks, Roly Poly. Me too. And you'll maybe step down off that barrel and help vote. I thought you said you know the rules, returned Silver contemptuously. Leastways, if you don't, I do. And I wait here, and I'm still your captain mind, till you out with your grievances. And I reply, in the meantime, your black spot ain't worth a biscuit. After that, we'll see. Oh, replied George, you don't be under no kind of apprehension. We're all square, we are. First, you made a hash of this cruise. You'll be a bold man to say no to that. Second, you let the enemy out of this here trap for nothing. Why did they want out? I don't know. But it's pretty plain they wanted it. Third, you wouldn't let us go at them upon the march. Oh, we see through you. We see, we see through you. John Silver. You want to play booty. That's what's wrong with you. We all want to play booty, George. I don't know what that means. And then fourth, there's this here boy. Is that all? Asked Silver quietly. Enough, too, retorted George. We'll all swing and sun dry for your bungling. Well, now look here. I'll answer these four points, one after another, I'll answer them. I made a hash of this cruise, did I? Well, now, you all know what I wanted, and you all know, if that had been done, that we'd have been aboard the Hispaniola this night as ever was, every man of us alive, and fit, and full of good plum duff, lovely birthday cake, and the treasure in the hold of her by thunder. Well, who crossed me? 
Who forced my hand as was the lawful captain? Who tipped me the black spot the day we landed and began this dance? Oh, it's a fine dance, I'm with you there. And looks mighty like a hornpipe in a rope's ended execution docked by London town, it does. But who done it? Why, it was Anderson. And Hans. And you, George Merry. It was George Merry, not George Fouracres. For you. And you're the last above board of that same meddling crew. And you have the Davy Jones's insolence to stand, to stand for captain over me. You that sank the lot of us by the powers, but this tops the stiffest yarn to nothing. Silver paused, and I could see by the faces of George and his late comrades that these words had not been said in vain. That's for number one cried the accused, wiping the sweat from his brow, for he had been talking with a vehemence that shook the house. Why, I give you my word, I'm sick to speak to you. You've neither sense nor memory, and I'll leave it to fancy where your mother's was that let you come to see. See, gentlemen of fortune, I reckon tailors is your trade. Go on, John, said Morgan. Speak up to the others. Oh, the others, returned John. They're a nice lot, ain't they? You say this cruise is bungled. Oh, by come if you could understand how bad it's bungled, you'd see. With that near the gibbet that my neck's stiff, we're thinking of it. You seen them maybe, hanged in chains, birds about them, seamen pointing them out to go down with the tide. Who's that, says one? That, why, that's John Silver. I know him well, says another, and you can hear the chains a-jangle as you go about and reach for the boy. Boy, that's boy, B-U-O-Y. Boy. Not the boy. He's got nothing to do with this. He's talking about a boy in the sea when they're floating along. Now that's about where we are. Every mother's son of us. Thanks to him, George, Mary and Hans and Anderson and other ruination fools of you. And if you want to know about number four and that boy, actual boy this time, Jim Hawkins, why well, shiver my timbers, isn't he a hostage? Are we going to waste a hostage? No. Not us. He might be our last chance, and I shouldn't wonder. Kill that boy. Not me, mates. And number three. Ah, well. There's a deal to say to number three. Maybe you don't count it nothing to have a real college doctor come to see you every day. You, John, with your head broke. Or you, George Merry, that had the egg you shakes upon you not six hours agone. And has your eyes the colour of lemon peel to this same moment on the clock. So that's why he's got yellow eyes. It's not from the booze. He's had a fever. The egg you. Which is what my grandmother still calls it. The egg. Eggy belt, she calls it. Oh, he's had a bloody eggy bart. Your eyes the colour of lemon peel to this same moment on the clock. And maybe, perhaps, you didn't know there was a consort coming either. But there is. And not so long till then. And we'll see you'll be glad to have a hostage when it comes to that. And as for number two, and why I made a bargain. Well, you came crawling on your knees to me to make it. On your knees! You came. You was that downhearted and you'd have starved too if I hadn't but that's a trifle you look there that's why and he cast down upon the floor a paper that I instantly recognized none other than the chart on yellow paper with the three red crosses that I had found in the oil cloth at the bottom of the captain's chest the treasure map why the doctor had given it to him was more than I could fancy but if it were inexplicable to me, the appearance of the chart was incredible to the surviving mutineers. They leapt upon it like cats upon a mouse. It went from hand to hand, one tearing it from another, and by the oaths and cries and the childish laughter with which they accompanied their examination, you would have thought not only were they fingering the very gold, but were at sea with it besides in safety. Yes, said one, not sure which one. That's Flynn, sure enough. J.F. And a score below with a clovich to it, so he ever... And a score below with a clovich to it, so he don't ever... Just a little his signature. Mighty pretty, said George. But how are we to get away with it and us no ship? 
Silver suddenly sprang up and supported himself with a hand against the wall. Now I give you warning, George, he cried. One more word of your source and I'll call you down and fight you. How? Why, how do I know? You ought to tell me that you and the rest had lost me my schooner with your interference, burn you. But not you, you can't, you ain't got the invention of a cockroach. But civil you can speak and shall, George, marry you may later that. That's fair enough, said the old man Morgan. Fair, I reckon so, said the sea cook. You lost the ship, I found the treasure. Who's the better man at that? And now... I resign, by thunder. Elect whom you please to be your captain now. I'm done with it. Silver, they cried. Barbecue forever. I realise that might sound insane out of context, that the pirates all just suddenly went, Barbecue forever. But it's because barbecue is... Is Long John's nickname, as we established much, much earlier on in the book, and he hasn't been called since. Barbecue. Barbecue, the sea cook. Long John Silver. Silver! They cried. Barbecue forever! Barbecue for Captain! So that's the tune, is it? Cried the cook. George? Yes. Oh, sorry. George? I reckon you'll have to wait another turn, friend. And lucky for you as I'm not a revengeful man. But that was never my way. And now, shipmates, this black spot ain't much good now, is it? Dick's crossed his luck and spoiled his Bible, and that's about all. It'll do to kiss the book on still, won't it? Growled Dick. He was evidently uneasy at the curse he'd brought upon himself. A Bible with a bit cut out. Returned Silver derisively. Not it. Don't buy no more than a ballad book. Don't it though? Cried Dick with a sort of joy. Well, I reckon that's worth having too. Dick's a bit. Here, Jim. Here's a curiosity for you, said Silver, and he tossed me the paper. It was a round about the size of a crown piece. One side was blank, for it had been the last leaf, and the other contained a verse or two of revelation. These words among the rest which struck sharply home upon my mind. Without are dogs and murderers. The printed side had been blackened with wood ash, which had already begun to come off and soil my fingers. On the blank side had been written with the same material one word. Deposed. Deposed, there were two Ps. I have that curiosity beside me at this moment. But not a trace of writing now remains beyond a single scratch, such as a man might make with his thumbnail. That was the end of the night's business. Soon after, with a drink all round, including Jim, give, a, give that six-year-old a double rum. Soon after, with a, with a drink all round, we lie down to sleep. And the outside of Silver's vengeance was to put George Merry up for sentinel and threaten him with death if he should prove unfaithful. George Merry's like that. Now then, George, you keep the night watch 12pm to 6am. Then you can have a sleep. What time are we heading out, Captain? 6.30. George Merry's like that. Oh, barbecue! It was long ere I could close an eye. And heaven knows I had matter enough for thought in the man whom I had slain that afternoon in my own most perilous position. What's George Merry going to see with his lemony eyes? More fruit? Maybe that's the specific side effect of his fever. And you with your eyes what looked like lemons... What are you talking about, you giant melon? What? What are you... Giant melon? Are you not a giant melon? No, it's me, Long, Long John Silver. Oh. 
Well, who's that pile of oranges? That's that's Morgan, the old fella Morgan. What are you talking about? I'm not a pile of oranges. <sighs> well, then what about him there? <laughs> that banana. That's that's Jim Hawkins, the kid. Ah! He just runs out into the sea. <sighs> Climbs into the sea, sees all the um, sees all the sea lions. Ah! Giant grapes! Ah! Oh, we could get on, couldn't we? Long John Sliver of Melon. Very good, Riz. It was very good. It was long ere I could close an eye. Grapes! <laughs> I wish he'd shut up out there. Oh! Ah! There's a coconut! It's a moving coconut. Oh no, sorry, it was a crab. It was long ere I could close an eye. And heaven knows I had matter enough for thought in the man whom I had slain that afternoon. In my own most perilous position. And above all, in the remarkable game that I saw Silver now engaged upon. Keeping the mutineers together with one hand and grasping with the other. After every means possible and impossible. To make his peace and save his miserable life. He himself slept peacefully and snored aloud. Oh. You need later that. Bye, Thunder. Yet my heart was sore for him. Wicked as he was, to think on the dark perils that environed and the shameful gibbet. Thing what you hang people on that awaited him. End of chapter.